Of all the animals that I'm lucky enough to work with, snakes have to be some of the most fascinating, but by far the most misunderstood. And wherever snakes and humans coexist, there's all sorts of myths and urban legends about these reptiles. So in today's video, we're gonna bust seven snake myths that I'm sure you guys have heard of. Stick around guys, this should be a very interesting video. So myth number one is that venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes are able to interbreed and are out there creating some sort of hybrid super snakes and you never really know what's venomous and what's non-venomous. Now this just isn't possible. Now I can understand why it is confusing and it basically comes down to the fact that most people aren't aware of just how diverse the snake family is. Physically, they all look relatively similar to the human eye. They're all basically the same body shape. But to understand just how vast the snake sort of family is, we've got to understand a little bit about taxonomy. When we break animals into basically how closely related they are, the first level is species. So we're Homo sapiens. Sapiens is our species. Then there's genus, and different animals within the same genus often can cross-breed. So two different carpet pythons, for example, humans and Neanderthals, for example. Lots of animals within the same genus can cross-breed with one another. After that, you've got family, and animals can't interbreed with animals at their own family level as a general rule of thumb. Now, venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes aren't even related at the family level. For example, our pythons, like this spotted python here, fit into the family Pythonidae. And the elapids, our venomous snakes, fit in the family Elapidae. These guys aren't related until you get to what we call a suborder, which is serpentes. Human beings, Homo sapiens, fit into the suborder what we call Haplorini, which is basically the dry nosed primates. So it's all monkeys, all apes, except for things like the lemurs, who have a wet nose like a dog. So not only are we closer to a chimpanzee than these two are to each other, we're actually closer to things like baboons and spider monkeys then venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes are to one another. So genetically, these guys are far too distant apart to be able to crossbreed with one another. So it's a myth busted. Now myth number two is that baby venomous snakes are either more venomous or more dangerous than their adult counterparts. Now there's two sorts of chains of thought to this. Some people say that baby snakes are born with more potent venom to enable them to catch their first feeds or something. Other people say that baby venomous snakes haven't learned how to control their venom and so inject every little bit that they've got. Now, both of these myths are basically just that, myths. As far as number two, injecting all their venom, baby venomous snakes are born as miniature versions of mum and dad. So they're born with the ability to track down prey, to catch it, to kill it, to find shelter. Once they grow up, they find a mate without learning the birds and the bees from mum and dad. They don't need to really learn anything. So they're born with the ability to control their venom output just the same way as their parents are. On top of that, even if they did inject all their venom, a baby venomous snake has less venom in its full glands than an adult venomous snake might have just sitting in its face. So there's going to still be less venom there in total. As far as toxicity goes, again, the vast majority of venomous snakes are exactly the same from the day they're born till the day they die. There might, however, be a couple of exceptions, and one of them is the eastern brown snake, this guy here. We now know that some eastern brown snakes seem to change the makeup of their venom as they grow older, but it's not necessarily to make them less venomous and then more venomous as babies. In fact, it might be the other way around. Studies have shown that juvenile brown snakes, who mostly feed on reptiles, seem to have venoms that are designed really to target reptiles as successfully as possible and to kill something like a skink very quickly. As they grow up, their venom composition seems to change over time to target mammals as they eat more things like mice and rats. However, we're mammals, so you could argue that as they grow up, their venom becomes more mammal specific, making them more dangerous to people. Again, disputing the fact that they're more venomous to human beings as babies. So no, baby venomous snakes are not more venomous or put out more venom in a bite than their adult counterparts. Myth two is busted. Myth number three is that pythons like Samson here, our Darwin carpet python, kill their prey by suffocating it. Now again, this is fair enough. To the untrained eye, constriction looks like the prey is suffocating to death. You'll often see, you know, the rat, the possum, whatever it is they're eating, gasping for breath. But what puzzled scientists for a little while is that the prey seems to die a lot quicker than suffocation would take. For instance, in the handful of cases where human beings have been constricted by pythons, death can occur in less than a minute. But the human body can go three minutes without oxygen. So what's happening? We now know that pythons actually squeeze their prey so tightly that they're disrupting the body's ability to transport blood around the body. So even though you might still have oxygen in your blood 
floating around, the blood's not able to move and get that oxygen to where it needs to be. So you're basically going into cardiac arrest. It's more like having a heart attack than it is by suffocating. So it's a lot quicker. And this makes sense. You see, from the snake's point of view, it's a lot safer to have that prey die as quickly as possible. It's less time for that you know, deer, that antelope, that possum, whatever, to bite, kick, scratch back, and the snake to get injured. So yes, snakes do squeeze their prey to death, but their prey does not really die of suffocation. It dies due to a circulation being shut off. Number four is that snakes dislocate their jaws when they eat. Now again, all myths have an element of truth and this one looks fair enough. When you see a snake eat, they can swallow something many times the width of their own head, but they do not have to dislocate their jaws. And I always explain to people, put it this way, if you've ever dislocated any part of your body, it hurts. If you had to do that every time you ate, you'd probably starve to death. Now the reason snakes are able to eat such big prey items without dislocating their jaws is their skulls are built very differently. Diana here, her skull comes in several different pieces, but the most notable difference is she doesn't have a chin bone. Her jaws are two separate pieces with a gap in between. Her jaws are able to move independently of one another. It means they're able to stretch out much wider than the jawbone is built to be. So no, snakes do not dislocate or unhinge their jaws. They're just built with specifically designed skulls to be able to stretch over something many times the width of their head. Number five is that snakes are slimy. Now, this might come back to the fact that snakes have fairly glossy skin, so they can have a wet sort of sheen to them. But it's actually physically impossible for snakes to produce any sort of slime or mucus. You see, snake scales, or reptile scales in general, are made out of keratin, which is what your hair and your fingernails are made out of. Now, this means that they're very impermeable. Nothing can come out. Snakes can't even sweat. Now, this has enabled them to colonise habitats like deserts, such as where this guy, the Centralian carpet python lives, because they have very, very minimal water loss. However, it also means that they can't, nothing can come out. So not just water, something like slime or mucus can't come out their skin either. So no, snakes are not slimy whatsoever. Number six is that snakes are completely deaf. Now, this is actually one that snake experts have touted for many, many years. And it's only been in more recent time we've had any real information about it. You see, snakes don't have any external ears. There's no holes on the sides of their head like humans or lizards or other reptiles do. But they do have all the other internal aspects of a working ear except for the external ear and the eardrum. It turns out though that their lower jaw, which we said in our last month, they've got two different sides, is connected directly to the parts of their ear that then connect onto the brain. So a lot of people say that snakes can sense or feel vibrations, but the way this is hooked up, it's more likely that they actually hear vibrations. So they can feel that vibration through the ground, goes through their ear to their brain, and it makes a sound to them. Now, the fact that snakes can sense some sort of vibration has been known by a lot of people for a long time, but whether or not they can hear airborne sounds has been up for more debate. In recent years, a university in Denmark decided to put this to the test and they suspended speakers over the top of ball pythons and they played noises at various frequencies. With little electrodes in the snakes, they were able to determine whether they could pick up the sound or not and they found that the snakes were able to actually detect some noises through the air. Now, the noises they detected the best were actually very low frequency sounds. To give you an idea of the kind of noise it was, they matched up with basically the lowest notes on a cello. So, not necessarily noises that they're going to hear out in the wild, not your kids squealing or something like this. Low pitched sounds, but it turns out snakes aren't entirely deaf, they just have poor hearing. So, myth busted, snakes aren't completely deaf. And lastly, myth number seven, and this one, I don't know if you could even call it a myth. It's grown to the point where it's an urban legend. And that is that snakes size up their owners to see if they could eat them. You cannot be involved with reptiles without somebody coming up to you at some point in your life and telling you that my friend or my cousin or my best mate's uncle's dog's last owner has a snake and it was measuring them as they were sleeping. It stretched out and they went to the vet and the vet told them that to get rid of the snake because it was sizing them up and figuring out if it could eat them yet or not. Now this flat out is not true, for a couple of reasons. For the first one is, snakes don't really think this way. They sort of give it a go and find out. But on top of this, length is actually not that important as far as prey items goes. 
You see, Natasha here is already longer than I am tall. So how much longer than me does she have to get? What's important with Snake is girth, and I'm far too wide for her to eat. On top of this, measuring your prey is basically completely unachievable in the wild where snakes have evolved. A girl like Natasha here would easily eat something like a large brush tail possum. Now, she can't just cruise on up to a possum, excuse me, do you mind lying down while I measure you, and then seeing if I can eat you or not. She basically has to have a look at it, so I think I can. She bites it, wraps it up, constricts it, and then swallows it. And there's multiple examples of snakes swallowing things or trying to swallow things that are too big for them, and either having to give up halfway, spit it out, or actually doing themselves injury, either hurting themselves or even killing themselves. This has actually even happened to human beings who have kept snakes as pets. Now in Australia, there's only one species of python that's ever been responsible for human death. And it's this guy here, the scrub python. They do get a lot bigger than this. Several years ago, a decade or more ago now, a fellow was found in his home dead with crush injuries and his pet scrub python was cruising around the house. So it's an example of where a snake has seen something, gone in a food response, been strong enough to kill it, not big enough to eat it. So he's just cruised around and, and you know, look for somewhere warm to sit and think about what he's done. So no, snakes do not size up their prey. Your second cousin's uncle's best friend's last wife does not have a pet snake. He's gone to the vet and the vet's told them that they've got to get rid of it because it's sizing them up. It's just a myth and it's busted. At the end of the day, snakes are some of the most fascinating animals on earth. Even people who don't like them have sort of a morbid curiosity about snakes. When you add to the fact that they're about as foreign to a human being as an animal can get, they have no maternal care, no arms, no legs, they don't show emotion on their faces, anything like this, and the fact that many of them can be dangerous to us, it's a little surprise that they sort of accumulate all these myths and urban legends about them. But in my opinion, snakes are interesting and bizarre enough that there is so many cool facts about snakes without having to exaggerate or make any more up. And if you'd like to learn some of these cool facts about snakes from all over Australia and around the world, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've got 200 videos out there talking about not just snakes, but crocodiles and wombats and possums and koalas. So there's lots of cool wildlife content here on the channel. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, all that kind of stuff, and check on back next week because there's lots more wildlife content coming. But between now and then, guys, as always, be nice to wildlife, including snakes. Have a good one and take care.